<laughs> okay. Um, thank you for being here. Uh, we are here with Mark Andre Lemberg. Uh, he's um, he's a Python uh, core developer. He has been the co he's uh, he's the co-founder of the Python Software Foundation. Um, but now he will share with us um, a few tips and tricks on how to manage, uh, how to program in Python uh, with small teams. Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, most, most of what I do was already said. So um, I'm Mark Lemberg. I, uh, I am a Python core developer, PSF board member. Uh, I'm also an EPS uh, board member, the EuroPython Society. Uh, I have a company called eugenics.com. We do Python projects and consulting for, for our customers. So we, a uh, customer comes to us with a great idea. They want it implemented. They don't necessarily have the right skills for that. And we help them to make that a reality. Um, I'm based in, in Germany, in Düsseldorf. And, well, I like nice things. So just going to start. Right, so this is the agenda. I'm going to uh, go through the talk. Um, I'm first going to give a short introduction. I'm going to uh, tell a few things about running projects, then uh, share a few things that we learned in the projects that we ran. If you have any questions, please speak up. Uh, I think it's very important to, to get this uh, talk kind of interactive. Um, if you don't want to interrupt the talk, then you can take notes and we can have a, a QA afterwards and then discuss things there. Right, let's start with the introduction. So what's a typical IT project? Uh, what you normally get in an IT project is you get a specification from the customer, which basically details all the things that you have to do in the, uh, in the project. Then you, you write a prototype. And, of course, we do that, do that in, in Python. Uh, then you have to come up with a design. And I had the talk yesterday about how to design these things. And then the next step is you take the prototype and you convert it into some real-life kind of language, like C++ or Java. And then you have deployment and support. So that's the, the standard kind of IT project that you normally do. Now, with, with Python, things work a little differently. So first you start again with an idea specification. It doesn't have to be too, it doesn't have to be too detailed because uh, Python makes it possible to easily change your project even within the uh, actual implementation phase and even later on in the deployment phase. So you can, actually, you can easily uh, adapt it to new requirements. So again, you write the prototype in Python. Uh, you design while you prototype, so you don't you, you don't have to do an, a, a long upfront design. You can, you can do that in, in smaller steps. And then the prototype turns into the implementation. So you completely skip the re-implementation phase. You don't need to use uh, Java or C++. You may need it in a few places where you need uh, lots of speed. Then you can fall, to, fall back to, to, to C and then have uh, C extensions for Python doing the fast stuff. But in general, you can nowadays do most of the things in Python, so you don't really uh, need C developers on your project. And then again, you have deployment and support. So what are the advantages of doing Python projects? Well, first of all, like I said, you can completely skip the re-implementation re -implementation phase in, in Java or C++. And uh, that makes it possible to, to have a very lean kind of project setup. You can easily adapt to changes. It's, it's very easy to, to, for example, integrate new features into your application when you use Python. Uh, it has an excellent time to market. You can develop things very quickly. You can work with smaller teams than you have to in, in a Java or C++ project. And overall, and that's what the, the customers usually like, is uh, it's the costs are much lower because you have to pay for fewer developers. And so, Overall, it's a, it's a complete win situation for the customer if you use Python. Now, of course, changing the standard model of IT projects also brings along some problems. 
uh, the, the, the major problem is that you no longer have a trial and error phase. What you normally do in an RT project with the prototype, you no longer have because your prototype turns into your actual product. So you need to be very careful when, when writing that prototype. So you need to focus very much on design. The code that you write has to be very flexible because you might need to make changes. And something else is very important, you need scalability. And that has to be built right into the design from, from the start. You don't have this prototype phase anymore, so you have to think about scalability right uh, when, you, when you start your application design. Something else that's problematic is that you no longer have this linear project flow. So there's, there's no longer the, the possibility to, to uh, develop the project in steps. You often do have loops in it. I mean, you, you probably know that from agile development that you, you always, you, uh, you write something, you go back to the customer, show it to them, then you discuss it, then you uh, get change requests and you put those change requests back into the product. In the traditional um, IT development, those phases exist as well, but they are uh, not as tightly bound into the, the project as with a Python project. And so to overcome these challenges, you need good project coordination. Right, so running a project. Well, first of all, you have to have um, the project specifications. So there are different types of projects that you can run. Uh, you can have open source projects, like for example, OpenStack would be one, or Python itself would be one. You can have open-ended projects that don't necessarily have a fixed deadline, but they uh, basically say, when you have the feature set completely developed and implemented, then you're done, and then, then you release. We had that in Python some years ago, and then changed <coughs> to, to a fixed deadline kind of setup. Um, then you have, that's a more typical case, you have fixed deadline setups where you where the customer basically says, I want to launch my, I don't know, new website or new, new feature or new service on a certain date. And unfortunately, those deadlines, they are usually defined by the customer. So you don't, don't really have much, much say in that. And because customers often don't really know how to uh, correctly estimate the time it takes to develop these things, you have very short deadlines. And so that's what I'm going to focus on. Okay, so you know what kind of uh, deadline you have. Now, you need next thing that you have to do is you have to write a, a specification for your project. <clears throat> the best thing that you can do is you develop that specification together with your client. So uh, you try to avoid the case that the client comes up to you with a, a pre-written specification, say a 100-page document uh, that you then have to take and then implement. The reason I'm saying that is the customer will usually have a traditional IT project in mind. And in Python, things work a little differently in many cases. So it makes a lot of sense to tell the customer to not spend too much time into developing the, thing, developing the specification up front, but to instead make that part of the project. And then you can, because you're working with them to develop their specification, you can take influence. You can, for example, choose the right tools, the right third-party libraries that you would like to use in your project. Uh, you, can, you can hash out things like licensing problems with those third-party uh, libraries that you want to choose. And you can also try to influence the, the deadline and the, the milestones that you have in your project. It's very important to to make the customer learn about these things. Uh, we've often had the, had the problem that we got a more or less complete specification. We had to go back to the customer and make lots of changes. Of course, the customer didn't like that because they are, had already invested a lot of time into writing it. And uh, it's, so it's, it's very important if you have a customer for multiple projects to, to tell them that it's better to work that way and to, to avoid this duplication of work. Okay, next thing is you need to build a team. Of course, you need some developers. You need a project manager. Uh, I'm always using PM for that. There are different ways of structuring your teams. Um, at Eugenics, we usually use small teams, and uh, we work with remote developers. So that's what I'm going to focus on in the talk. But of course, there are other set setups. In Python, in general, you don't have large teams on the projects, because if you make the teams too large, the overhead 
that gets added by, by communication and feedback, uh, it simply kills the efficiency <coughs> in your project. The reason is that it's very fast to develop. You, you can very quickly develop things in Python. And so the, the developers often have to go back to the project manager to get uh, feedback about their particular way of, of implementing something. So the, feed, the, the project manager becomes the bottleneck in the project. Yeah? You, you mentioned now developers, but testers are also part of the team. Sh can, can we add testers to the 10 developers so that we have 15 people in the team? Actually, that's a good question. I'd have to think about that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the reason is that we, in, in, uh, we don't have separate uh, testers. So the developers write the unit tests. We always run the unit tests. So there's no separate uh, step for, for actually for, for um, having testers work on, on the project. That's something that's usually done by the customers. Yeah? So they, they have the, the Q&A the Q team then uh, work on, on the application later on. Right, so what I found is that, but that's just my personal um, experience, is that you can, you can scale, scale this up for, for Python projects to up to 10 developers, but after that it gets inefficient. So if you, if you, have more, if you need more than 10, 10 developers in a, in a project, and it's better to have multiple teams, and then have those, the, the team project managers, then report to the central project manager. Right, so next thing is a team location. Um, the typical setup is you have everyone sitting in an office. That works fine. It's very efficient because a short communication uh, pass. Then you can have remote people. You can have a mix of both. And if you mix both, then you have to pay attention to the, the communication overhead that you have with remote team members. And it's very important to synchronize both. Uh, this is important because the things can, can easily be done in the office without having the remote people know about it. So you have to make sure that the office people always uh, use the standard communication mechanisms in your project so that everyone knows where the project currently is. And the feedback loop that I just mentioned to the project manager also takes longer if you have remote people on your team. So that's something to consider. OK, so you want to set up your team. You know how many people you need. And the next step is to, to find the team members. Now, if you have a large company, you, you can uh, probably choose from quite a big pool of developers. Um, if you're like us, a very small company, and we usually work with freelancers, we have to go out to the, into the Python community and, and use our network to find the proper people for, for that particular project. So what we usually do is we, we look at the various tasks that we have in the project, the various um, skills that we need, say, I don't know, PDF generation or uh, web front end or database back end. And then, then we get specific uh, highly skilled people for, for those developer positions. <clears throat> uh, it's very important if you have short deadlines that you, you make the whole team as efficient as possible. So you have to focus on developers that can actually work on their own and don't need to go back to the project manager a lot. It's very important for, for, for the project manager to be able to give a task to a developer. The, ta the developer then goes away for a couple of days and then brings back a, a nicely working uh, Python package in an ideal world, of course. Um, but that's something that you should focus on, and you should make sure that the people are uh, set up for this. If you have longer running projects, then it's also, you can also have uh, people on board that are basically trained on the job, so you have uh, beginners or intermediates on the project. But if you have short deadlines, it's very important to have, get uh, highly skilled people. Right, and how do you get the team to, to work with those uh, short deadlines? <clears throat> well, I'm going to talk about this from a project manager perspective, because that's <coughs> what I am in, in the company. Um, the way that you get people to work quickly is you set deadlines. Just like the customer does with you, you have to set deadlines for the developers and get really angry if they don't meet the, the deadlines. Uh, you have to be very responsive. So if, if, a, pro if a, a developer asks a question, it shouldn't take too long for, for you to answer those questions. And you have to 
then really work with them to get the problem that they have uh, resolved. You need to give feedback. And, and the feedback, uh, well, I, I can't say this often enough. You have to give, give feedback to, to, to the developers because they want to know how good their work is. So most of the time, of course, the work is excellent. So you need to tell that to the developers. And that makes them feel right and feel good about it. Uh, you also have to give them feedback that you learn from the customer, which is also very important. And, of course, as project manager, you have to work just as hard as the developers so that they see that it's not just them working hard, but you're working hard as well. Communication. Um, there are two lines of communication that you have in a project. One is from the project manager to the customer, and the other is from the project manager to the developers. Uh, I found in my experience that you should always avoid communication between the customer and the developer, or the developer and the customer. The reason for that is, well, it's actually uh, many things. It's, for example, developers to customer. If you have that kind of communication, the developers, they don't know the setup that you have with the customer. They don't necessarily know what you've discussed with them when setting up the projects and, and the contracts and everything. Um, they may not know about uh, or may not have the proper communication skills to talk to, to the customer. So that kind of uh, direction of communication can, can cause some, con some uh, problems and conflicts in your setup. Uh, the other way around also doesn't necessarily work. For example, if you have a customer talk directly to a developer, the customer can put pressure on the developer. And then the developer doesn't know how to react to that because there's no project man manager in between to buffer this pressure. And uh, that's something that, that's very difficult to, to deal with for the developers. And if you can, you should, you should not, for example, give the email addresses of the developers to the customers so that they can, can't use that path. They often like to use that path or want to use that kind of path because, I don't know, say the developer is, 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 not, is not reachable for some reason. They want to be able to directly talk to the developers, but it's better to just keep them waiting until you get back and you can handle the case. Yes? Second. Is the question? Usually between iterations, uh, a previous company I used to work with, they would already, they would always have a, like a feedback session um, where for that one period, the clients and the developers kind of were able to say, well, did we understand correctly the requirements? Uh, are we headed the right direction? Um, that, of course, caused uh, you know, the, the whole idea of feature creeps coming in and all that. Um, have, I was just wondering, uh, is there such a thing as a, having a feedback moment between the client and the developer? Or should that, even that should be avoided? I would avoid even that. I would just have the, the project manager be the central contact and uh, not, not have direct communication between the developers and the, the customers. It's, it's because, I mean, the, the way that developers communicate is often very different from the way that the project manager communicates with the customer. It's, it has very much to do with politics in, in, uh, in setting up your, I mean, in, in the communication. You have to be careful what you say. Okay, because the, really the motivation behind that was a lot of the times the customer did not uh, really know what they wanted. It was more like, um, this might be what we want, show us something, we investigate and we provide feedback and that's pretty much how the uh, uh, back and forth was happening. Right, that, that's something that the project manager should do. And that's also what I have on this slide here. This is basically about the, the customer communication. So the, the project manager needs to give regular status updates to the client, of course. It's very important. The project manager also has to get the client to tell him about project changes. This may be obvious, but in reality it's not. So uh, 
it often happens that the client makes some internal changes to the project or to the expectation of the project and doesn't tell the project manager. So you have to be uh, really pushing for, for getting that information. Um, you have to manage the deadlines. You have to be very transparent about everything. And with transparency, what we usually do is we give them access to our bug tracker so that they can look at the bug tracker. Uh, then again, in reality, they never do, but they feel very good about it to be able to access everything. Yeah. Well, thank you. Right. And your point was basically about developing and updating the, the product specification during the project, and that's basically this feedback loop. So you, you have uh, milestones in your project, and every time you reach a milestone, you show it to your customer, and then you get feedback from them. And then they say, well, I wanted this differently uh, done, or I want this to look like that, or I need this new feature, or you've implemented that in a, diff in a, in a way that's not really uh, what we thought it would be, this kind of thing. OK, next thing, project communication. Uh, this is very important. We tried in, in a few projects to do daily meetings with the developers. So we had a one-hour meeting every day to, to get updates from everyone. That turned out to be very, very inefficient because in the end, we, we ended up just basically discussing the problems of two or three developers in that meeting. And all the other developers were just sitting there waiting for the meeting to get to be over, to continue to work again. So we stopped doing that. Um, there are various approaches to do project management to, for example, do weekly meetings. Um, after this, the experience with the daily meetings, we decided that we, we really don't need regular meetings. Instead, what we do is we do meetings on demand, and we always have an, a chat window open. So all the developers can always see what's going on and can also see the discussions. But they don't have to sit there and, and, and wait for, for a meeting to, to get over. They can continue with their work and only monitor that chat window every now and then for, for any new updates. And then if something, if something happens that needs all of the developers uh, to be informed, then you do a meeting. Yes, another one there. I think, I think we should probably cue the questions a bit more. <laughs> Hello, just a second, you get the mic in a minute. Um, have you tried stand-ups and uh, your team, is it like um, a grown team? Do the developers know each other like for years or do you shuffle your teams around? Uh, so stand-ups and team kind of... Um, you mean this kind of weekly stand-up thing? Yeah? No, daily, like oh, 10 daily, minutes, 50 no. minutes. Because an hour is very long, but right. you know, just 50 minutes or 10 minutes, it works pretty good, I think. Well, we, we, all, we always work with uh, remote people. So um, if, you, if you do a remote meeting, then uh, weekly stand-up still takes long because only one person can speak and all the others have to then um, have to listen and, and, and stand there. We found it's much better to just use the chat window and do this asynchronously. But that's just our experience. I mean, of course, it, it probably works in, in, in different ways as well. So this weekly stand-up or uh, daily stand-up might, might be a good idea for, for other teams. Uh, in the teams I worked in, it's also uh, like five uh, people maximum or something. And uh, yeah, we did uh, daily stand-ups, uh, even remotely with uh, something like Hangout, for example. And it's uh, basically just uh, everyone says, uh, is everything fine? Uh, do I have tags? Uh, do I have any blockers? And uh, that you can then uh, say, okay, I have a blocker here. And I need you and you uh, to have a meeting afterwards. And uh, in general, it's like uh, 15 minutes or something uh, where you just uh, go quickly through it and uh, then decide, okay, we need another meeting or, yeah, we can just continue. Right. Yeah, maybe we should try that again with a 15-minute meeting. After this, 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 uh, this attempt to do daily meetings, uh, we basically just thought it would be better to just use a chat window. And it worked out well for us, but of course, it doesn't necessarily mean it works out well for, for everyone. Right. Just see whether I skipped her. No. All right. Initial setup. So you have your you have you have your team set up. You have the specification uh, uh, written. Uh, the next thing that you have to do is you have to uh, set up milestones for your project. <clears throat> this is very important because you 
first of all, you every now and then you want to show your customer where you are. So you want to have something that, that more or less works and that you can then uh, take into a customer meeting and, and demonstrate. Uh, you, need, you also need this for, for the feedback loop. It's also very important for the developers to work towards something that they can then basically release, sort of. Uh, so the way that we do it is we typically have a setup phase uh, where you basically you set up all the, the tools that you need for the project, um, the basic documentation. Uh, then we have a concept phase where we try out various things that we have in the project specification and see, for example, which third-party tools would be uh, necessary and or would actually work. And then you have the standard alpha, beta, release candidate, and release phase. There's uh, nothing special to that. After the release, you always have a support phase, or you have, uh, if, if, the, if you know that the, the product is going to be uh, developed over a certain amount of time, you have update releases in between. So for the update releases, you always collect new features, you implement them, and then every now and then you do an update. Um, I'm mentioning uh, these, this, this separately, the update and the support releases, because the, the amount of activity in the project goes down significantly after you have a release. That's simply because the, the product will actually then get used. You have a short, very intense support phase usually after the release because there are obviously there are bugs in the uh, application. You can't avoid them, so you have to fix them very quickly. But then after, after a while, things get, uh, get more... Um, well, quiet, and, and you can focus on other things. Uh, if you have a longer running project that has multiple releases, you always have to be aware of that. So it may make sense, for example, to scale down the, the, uh, pr the development team size during the, this more um, quiet phase, and then ramp it up again for the next update release. In any case, we do uh, milestones every two or four weeks, so you don't have to wait too long for the for the milestones to go back to your customer and get feedback. Um, it's also very important to have project documentation set up. This is important for, well, basically so that you don't lose information because uh, you always, you discuss things in the project, you make decisions in the project, uh, you come up with certain setups that you need and you should always document those things. We use a wiki for that. Other people use text files, REST files. You can also use Word or Google Doc or even a whiteboard and then if you're in the office and then put things on the whiteboard or an etherpad if you're working remotely. Task management, really nothing much new there. You use a ticket system, of course. Uh, the only thing that you have to uh, be careful with is that you, when you open a ticket with a certain task, the task should be easily manageable. So it should be implementable in a few days, not weeks. Of course, you can also open a, t open a ticket with a task that, that takes something like I don't know, three or four weeks to implement. But then that needs to be uh, what we call a meta ticket. So it's, it's not a ticket where you actually put the, the, all the patches on. It's just a ticket for organizing other tickets that you open for the smaller tasks. So like in the talk yesterday, you basically you take a, a launch a, pro a problem and you break it up into smaller pieces. And then you associate those, those smaller tickets with that bigger one. Ticket categories, yeah, we, we use track for, for doing uh, the ticket management. It offers various kinds of, of types of tickets. Um, we found that the type of ticket is really not that important because we rarely filter on that. Maybe you have a special kind of uh, type for features uh, that you, you come up during the project that you might want to implement, or maybe ideas. We have that in our system. But other than that, you just have a, a task ticket type, and that's it. Uh, the components that you have should map to the, the components that you have in your application design. And of course, you put the milestones in there. Right, so how does the, how does the work assignment work? So the project manager is in charge of assigning the work to the various people. And the project manager usually also opens these meta tickets. Uh, the, the assignment itself should, should ideally, if you want efficient work to be done, to be based on, on components, so not tasks. So you have in, in your team, you typically have developers that own a particular component in your uh, project. 
And then if you have something to do in that, if you have some task for that particular component, you assign to that particular developer. It's very important to do loose coupling with those uh, components because if you, um, let's say you, you have a, a typical problem where you have dependencies, for example, is when you do reports. So you, first you need to define a report, how it looks like. Then you uh, need to get the database to actually create the report. And then you need the report to be, for example, exportable as PDF. And so those uh, things, they need different people usually in your, in your project. <clears throat> so the, all people have to, have to wait for the database, to, to, uh, database developer to actually write the SQL that's needed to, to build the report. And then for the output, you need one of the web guys to do the web report, and you need one of the PDF guys to do the, to do the PDF report. Uh, so you don't have loose coupling between those, so yeah, there's a dependency. Everyone has to wait for the, for the database developer. So what you need to do is you need to make it possible for the people waiting on, on this database guy, for example, to be able to work on other things in the meantime. Right, and the next phases in the project are, of course, you have to actually do the work after you've set it up. Then you have the release, and then you have the support, and afterwards you have the finalization phase. I'm not going to go much into detail here because I don't have enough time for this. Um, might do some, some other talk about this, some maybe next year. The basic way that it works is that you, you go in, in, you go in, in cycles, you meet your, 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 well, hopefully you meet your deadlines. You go to the customer, show them your, your milestone. Uh, you go through the specification again. You check whether everything is, is okay, whether he actually, the, the customer actually expected uh, things to work in, in that way. Uh, what we found in, in projects very often is that uh, you sometimes reach a point where you need information from the, from the customer. For example, you need I know, some maybe laws that you need to implement, certain rules that you need to implement. Uh, the reports have to look in a certain way. So the, the project manager always has to go to the customer and try to get that information from the customer. And often enough, it doesn't really work on, in a timely manner. So you don't get the information uh, quick enough to actually implement the, and, and meet those deadlines. <clears throat> So what we usually do is we just uh, make up some assumptions for these things. Or we just, for example, for a report, we just write a, a very simple template and then just use that for the time being. We found that to be the only way to actually work with some customers because uh, it's, it just takes much too long to wait for them to get back to you. And then we show them the work and of course they complain because things don't work like they had expected. And then we explain that we didn't have the information, we had to make some choices for them and then we just fix things. And that's, again, something where you need to educate your, your customer and make them learn that these things are necessary and important. <coughs> right, so lessons learned. Um, we found there are different types of customers. These are just a few. Uh, one is an, a very experienced uh, customer who already knows how Python works and how efficient Python is, and of course they expect you to be very efficient and uh, very quick in, in everything that you do. Um, you need a, you need a, dif a different way of, of, of talking to, to these kinds of customers than the other uh, types that you have here. There's one type of customer that we often have is you have a customer that had, has great ideas, uh, mostly salespeople that have great, great ideas about uh, products but they have absolutely no IT experience. So they have no idea, for example, of coming up with proper estimates. Um, if you're lucky, you can, you can talk to the people before they publish uh, deadlines. For example, before a product manager goes out to the public and says that in six months we have this product. Um, if you're not so lucky, you just get that deadline, you have to deal with it. And then we have uh, had customers in the past that were actually selling solutions that didn't exist yet. So they were, they were basically telling the customer, well, in six months we're going to install this application on your system. And not a single line had been written. So not even the specification was, was done yet. So 
sometimes a bit difficult. So how can you deal with that? Well, first of all, is you, ha you have to be very, very clear in, in, in uh, talking to your customer. You have to tell them what the limits are. You have to tell them that you're just human. And uh, of course, you make mistakes and, and things don't always work as intended. Uh, you have to tell them about um, this concept of bugs, that applications tend to have bugs. Even, you try to, even if you try to write as many unit tests as possible, you, you're still going to hit a few bugs. Um, and then you have to discuss with the customer to, to match up their expectation with the realities of software development and find some kind of balance there. For example, if you get a chance, it's, it's very useful to define milestones together with them and then, for example, move features that they want in a very early phase to a later phase in the project. And that frees up time for other more important things. You need to educate your customer in software development because they often don't know how software development works. Uh, we sometimes had customers that that, for example, knew a bit of PHP and then they sat down and wrote a prototype in PHP. It took them half a day. Um, and then they thought, well, it can't take much longer to write that in Python, right? So, of course, if, you, if you're developing a, a, a production quality application, you have to have different things. You need to have unit tests, you need to have uh, you need to have error handling, you need to have proper logging, you need to make sure that the application continues running in case something goes wrong somewhere, all these things. And of course that takes time to implement and you have to tell your customers that it takes time to implement. Something else that I, I talked about that yesterday, refactoring is very important. So even though you've written something and it works and, and in the milestone you can show your customer that things actually work, they may come up with new features based on what you show them. And then you find that those features don't really match up to the implementation that you've done. And the right thing to do, of course, in software development is then to, to look at your, your code, refactor it so that it can handle both cases, the one that you've already shown to your customer and the, the new feature. And this is sometimes a bit difficult to, to tell your customer because basically they're paying for, for refactoring, for redoing something that's already been done. So, uh, yeah, you need to really demonstrate them that this works out. Um, then if you're in, in the support phase, support basically means you watch the application running and, and you try to fix bugs. Uh, if, you're, if you've done a good job in your project, then of course the, there won't be many bugs in your application and you won't hit many, many roadblocks. On the other hand, watching the application and monitoring it and looking through the, through the log files and, and, and doing um, data analysis of what goes in and what goes out, it takes time. But that's something that the customer doesn't see. So basically, the customer never gets any feedback from you, but you're still, uh, you're still billing them with, with a high amount of, of uh, support uh, hours. And of course, they, they tend to not understand. And so that's something, I don't have a good, good answer to that one. It's, uh, it's just, I mean, you're basically selling this warm fuzzy feeling to them. And they, they will only notice if something goes wrong and then yell at you. And if they're not seeing anything go wrong, they'll just, and especially their controllers, will just uh, then come to you and say, well, why do we need this in the first place? Uh, a similar problem is that's during the, the milestone phase. Um, if you're always on time with your, with your milestones and you meet all the deadlines, of course the customer should be happy about that. But then in reality they get used to it. And so if you come up to a milestone that's really hard to, to meet where you, where, where you have really uh, tight deadlines and you miss that deadline, they get really angry at you. So again, this is something that you have to tell your customers. You have to give them the right impression that meeting those deadlines was really hard work. They should be more careful about uh, adjusting their deadlines. And uh, you have to tell them that this is not the standard case necessarily happening if they set the deadlines the way that they used to. So again, you have to talk to your customers, be clear about these things, and then they, they tend to understand and, um, 
and come up with more uh, realistic deadlines. Okay, so I'm, I've been talking about deadlines a lot in the, in the talk, so I'm uh, going to focus a bit about uh, a bit on estimates. So how do you come up with proper deadlines from your perspective? Well, first of all, it's a, it's a, it's a very hard problem coming up with proper deadlines <coughs> and proper, proper estimates for everything. You need lots of experience. The best thing that you can do is you can just uh, create safety margins in your estimates. And basically the way that, I'm going to have a slide later on about that. Um, you need to you need to be you need to take many different things into account, and maybe not you, you don't know all of the different things that you need to take account into account. Uh, so I've I've put up um, a slide here, which is basically a recipe for doing estimates. So some things that you usually don't think about when when doing estimates, you don't think about the, the project overhead. So you just think about how long does it take to implement, I don't know, a certain class or certain function or method or feature. You don't think about demos that you have to do to your, to your customer. You don't think about mockups that they want because very often they, they want to start selling their product very early in the development phase. And uh, so they need some kind of mockups. Of course, that takes away development time again. Then you have customer meetings and meetings tend to take away lots of time. You need time for refactoring, for unexpected complica complications. Say you use a third-party library, and that suddenly a uh, sec falls on you. So you need to go into that library and try to find the various problems with that library. Um, then the, you have the human factor. People get sick, or they go to a conference, or uh, go on holiday, or I don't know. There's so many different things that can happen. You need to factor that into the estimates. And then, of course, you get new feature requests from your customer during the development, and those cause overhead as well. So what we usually do is we, we, we try to come up with a proper estimate, and then we put in a safety margin. And the safety margin can be anything between 2 and pi. That's what usually works out pretty well. If you want to be on the safe side, use pi, and otherwise just start with 2. But never, ever tell them your expected estimate. Right. And that's all I wanted to say. Any questions? Uh, are you using code reviews in uh, those small teams? Uh, yes. But, but we, we're not uh, currently using any of the code review um, the, the web interfaces that you have for code review. So basically, uh, we look at the, at the uh, check-ins. Uh, we, we have a mailing list where all the check-ins are sent. This is basically something that, I, that we copied from the Python development. We have the check-in list. And just like in Python, we do reviews on, on the check-in list. So it, it works a bit differently, for example, from what the OpenStack uh, team does. We don't have this rigid kind of uh, I don't know, checking everything uh, up front before actually merging the, the change into, into trunk. Of course, we always try to keep trunk working. But if it, if it doesn't work for some reason, it's a small team. It's not that, it's not that bad a thing to happen. All oh, right, yeah. I mean, of course, people start yelling at you, well, I can't continue with this work, so <laughs> you have to manage that. Yeah. Uh, hi. Very, very nice talk. Hi. And I would like to have a uh, tip and tricks uh, on how to get the specification after setting up, setting the price. Because usually customer says, okay, I, was some, I want something, we may discuss that later, tell me the price. Okay, price is done, now add feature, 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 feature. So what is the, right. well, any trick? Yeah, well, trick. The way that we do it is, um, or sometimes do it, is we, first of all, we try not to do fixed price uh, projects. Um, because fixed price projects always, always lead to that situation that you're talking about. So you, you, in the fixed price project, you always have a, a, a specification. And then, of course, people start changing things all around. And, and what you normally do is you have uh, this concept of change requests. And then change requests are always built by time. So uh, you can do it that way. Uh, but I would, I would try to avoid that 
because it always gets into discussions. Because the customer, of, or, 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 the customer usually thinks that everything is already defined by the specification, including the, the new feature that they that they want to see, and that can cause a conflict. And so it's usually better to just give them an estimate of the of the project costs, and then if you're good, you're you're basically they have to pay less than your estimate, the initial one. Um, and you're working just by the hour. Okay, so you still have a budget, uh, but it's not fixed price. Exactly. You say, this right. is my estimate, and then we will go in steps and exactly. build each step so that you know that how much it costs. Everybody. Right, and if you, if you see in the, in the development that the costs are going to go over the budget, then of course you have to talk to your customer again and, and explain to them that all these new features that they wanted in there took longer to implement. <coughs> Um, customer communication. Uh, it seems like uh, I've had a, enough, uh, a lot of uh, experiences where uh, the, the customer really had difficulty, um, I wouldn't say communicating, but maintaining a channel of communication. Mm -hmm. um, I, was, uh, I was wondering if there were any form of tools or tricks that you that kind of um you know kind of helped or at least uh, promoted a sense of communication between you and your customers well for a customer it, it uh, the customer relationship it makes sense to have regular meetings right even though it it, it costs a bit of time of, uh, but but it makes sense to do that because uh, because like you say and and we've had that too in in, in our projects uh, you sometimes tend to lose the contact with the with the customer because they have so many other things to do and, and are so focused on sales, for example, or have new ideas that they are following and, and trying to get implemented. And, and so it's, it's a good thing to have a regular kind of meeting with them or a regular kind of contact with them. Yeah. So, uh, who takes uh, part in this uh, development specification meetings? Only the project manager? Because um, usually we found that uh, the project manager talks to the client, okay, comes back, but developers have uh, many more questions, and then the project manager has to go back to the client, and so on. It's uh, Oh. Right. Well, the, the way that we do it is that I go to the customer and I talk to them, and because I have enough experience to know what questions to ask, I can ask them the proper questions, and then you avoid this kind of uh, feedback feedback loop that you otherwise need. Of course, it's also possible to set up a, a project where you have the the application designer as separate team member, and then in that case, the t the application designer would have to be in the same meeting with the with the customer. Thanks for the talk. In my company, we use uh, poker cards to estimate things, so then no one knows what the other one is. What's it is going Poker cards with numbers, planning okay. poker mm -hmm. cards. So I don't know if uh, other people do that. I think it's I interesting because um, allows you to not know what the others are going to say for this estimate, so you, you are more, <laughs> no one like speak first and then, uh, I don't know, other people use it or other possibilities to do that, other things? You mean in, in, a, in a meeting with the developers and then yeah, asking we, we the developers with how long everything takes, yeah? Well, with our product director and then we have all the stories we have to do for a certain thing. Mm -hmm. And then each of the story we have to like, say uh, how many points this thing is, which point is, I don't know, half a day for one person. Mm -hmm. And th so everyone gives a card, so no one sees what the other are saying. And then in the end we decide, and we discuss after we, we said, each one said what should right. be the estimate. Well, since so we're mostly working remotely with the teams, they just, I mean, each member just sends an email. Yeah. So it's basically sort of like what you're saying. Um, so the other developers, they don't see these estimates. Ah, okay. But then, of course, once we have the estimate, then we, of course uh, we, we tell everyone so uh, that everyone knows these these deadlines or the milestones that we have. 
Uh, what about a single team working on more than one project on the same time? I mean, it's better to move the, the next one after the current one and make the customer uh, wait or... Uh, th that's a good, it's a good question. Um, we've done that. We found that it's possible to do two projects uh, with the same team simultaneously, but more doesn't work. Simply because this, the context switch that everyone has to do for, for, for the projects, uh, it can actually cause confusion because the people think of different specifications uh, when, when working on one, well, on, 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 the, uh, on one project and then they switch to the other project and then have a different set of specifications there. So it's, it's probably better to, to not do more than two. Hi. Just as a comment to one of the earlier questions about how you do the planning, in our organization, we're pretty big, so our equivalent of the customer is the higher up is X. Answer for questions. We have a product owner that fights for our cause to say what can and cannot fit. They then come down to devs and QA to see our point of view, what can and cannot fit, and it goes back up to the um, execs saying this is what the team believes they can do and what can fit in.